So welcome everyone and uh, apologies again for running this uh, lecture only online. I just didn't want you uh, to lose the chance of meeting uh, Antonio Flores Galea, who is a uh, very productive author uh, and very interested in new technologies. So I asked him is to tell us something about uh, the controversial issues that he see when technology meets society. And also Antonio is, has just authored a new book, which is coming out now. And in a way, we are one of part of his launch events for this. So we are very lucky for that. Antonio, if you want to add something on this, please do. Otherwise, the floor is yours. I feel very uh, happy that you accepted my invitation. OK, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, I hope uh, that you, you come uh, understand the message that I'm trying to deliver today. Uh, I have to say I'm an engineer, uh, but today I'm not uh, I'm not uh, putting any slide about engineering or formulas or uh, whatever technical knowledge. It's more a philosophical um, uh, speech, a, a philosophical uh, uh, discussion and uh, please if you have any questions you can ask uh, on the chat or or live or after the meeting you have my email here and I'll be happy to to assist you well I, I I've called this uh, when technology meets society because uh, I want to focus on these uh, three technologies uh, that will likely disrupt uh, society in the coming years um, uh, the, the first, uh, the first of them is is very well known. Is artificial intelligence is now in, is is a bad word uh, now, and the, everyone is speaking about AI on media, etc. And uh, we'll see some interesting things about AI. The second one is the metaverse, or some people call it the Web three. Some others call immersive technologies. Uh, well. Uh, I think there is no standard definition for 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 the metaverse, but uh, many of us uh, will perfectly understand what is in, inside uh, this world in terms of technology. And the third one is the brain computer interfaces. PCI is, is uh, another uh, important technology that we will see in the next years. In fact. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think this week, uh, I, don't, I don't remember if it was uh, yesterday or Monday, um, Elon Musk uh, announced that they are negotiating with a hospital in, in the US to run tests for Neuralink in, in humans. So they are about to close an agreement to, to test a chip that is inserted or at least connected to, to the brain. And it's also a, another disruptive technology for the next uh, for the next year, for the next years. Uh, let me do a briefing one by one and uh, some conclusions. Uh, speaking of AI, the concept is not new at all. In fact, the concept is also blur in in all. These technologies, the concept is not uh, very precise. Uh, we can say that AI is the ability of a computer to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings, but this is so wide that, for example, a calculator could be an AI machine, and, and it isn't. Uh, but uh, as I say, it started after World War, World War II, and uh, it had a lot of expansion at theoretical level in the 80s and uh, at practical level uh, early in this uh, new century. And uh, we spoke before in the beginning about artificial intelligence just as systems that were uh, governed by rules. So what if, if this then do that, and this kind of deterministic rules. After that, uh, the concept of machine learning or neural networks uh, appeared, and we will see later uh, uh, a bit about it. And now we are experiencing what we call deep learning, and deep learning is nothing else than a much more complex machine learning algorithm, because now we have the technology, the practical equipment to run 
a lot of computing capacity and a lot of uh, uh, different data sources, different data types, and we have images, videos, uh, text, uh, etc. And we can perform much more complex uh, algorithms, but the, the basis of the technology is very similar to classical machine learning. Uh, to to speak uh, about uh, machine learning, we have to understand that, and I like very much this slide. is the only one with formulas, but we don't need to uh, to uh, deep uh, to dig uh, into these formulas. Uh, what we need to understand is how uh, how machine learning works. Uh, machine learning is based on replicating the way neurons uh, work in our brain. And you have a neuron here, a diagram of a neuron. Uh, it has a, the center of the cell is the soma. And then the information, the excitation uh, uh, comes uh, into the cell through the dendrites. And then uh, an output is provided uh, some centimeters, uh, or millimeters or centimeters or maybe feet uh, uh, ago in the axon. Uh, as another electrical stimulation to one, to other uh, neurons or, or other organs, muscles or whatever. Uh, it's uh, the, the the schematic function is that we receive a lot of inputs. We apply a simple multiplication on on, on, on weights uh, for each input, and then we add all the inputs and that is the the output so the output has a, a, a function that activates according to the strength of the combined inputs and this is the mathematical symbol for that is very easy to to understand so we exit uh, we excitate we activate the dendrites and then depending on the weights uh, on these weights for each input, the, the output will be larger or smaller. Uh, this is so simple as bits in computers, but when we combine a lot of neurons and you have some uh, typical schemes here, you can perform a lot of complex actions. And uh, I just wanted to, to illustrate what is uh, the use cases for neurons, uh, for neural, neural networks, uh, um, which is the, the formal name for, for machine learning architectures. They are very good in recognizing patterns, recognizing objects, uh, and, and uh, identifying anything uh, that they can replicate or they can mix and they can provide something in the middle. So, uh, for example, if we want uh, to use them to detect fake content, uh, then it's possible to use uh, machine learning, to use AI, because they are very good identifying what is different from, from before. Is uh, They work like uh, we, we can... Uh, we can guess what a, a machine learning system is able to do by uh, watching what chi what children uh, can do. Um, they can identify, they can replicate, they can find the seven differences in something. They can uh, do something that is the middle of uh, an average of A and B and C. These kind of things, they are absolutely powerful. The good uh, point about that is that they can do they can do that not only with numbers, they can do that with pixels, they, they can do that with full images, with uh, objects, with uh, videos, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the reason why we are using more uh, AI more and more in pattern recognition, for example, for fault detections. Uh, we are uh, using uh, neural networks or machine learning uh, systems to produce robo uh, robust uh, systems because they they always you you provide inputs and they always provide the the output that is more likely to be the correct one and uh, also deep monitoring uh, when we are unable to to mon monitor in real time for example 1000 or 5000 variables in a plant uh, we put a, a machine learning algorithm and uh, this uh, this algorithm is able to detect any difference in the expected pattern uh, very quickly and very easily. 
Uh, the, the last one is one of the implications. Uh, now, the problem with uh, machine learning is that uh, we have a risk of uh, believing that uh, machine learning results is the, the, the truth or the right answer for everything. And this is uh, related, uh, you have heard a lot of uh, about uh, uh, chat GPT uh, lately on the news. And uh, many people are asking ChatGPT uh, questions, expecting that uh, the, the machine tells them the truth, the, the, the answer, the right answer. And this is not uh, always uh, the truth. This is the truth according to the data that has been used to train the network. These networks, as I said before, is like a child. It's, it's like a child. So if you show uh, a child uh, some animals and you show uh, the, that child a cat, a dog, a, a crocodile, a snake, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then uh, this person, this child, is going to answer when when he's watching another animal. Uh, he will be able to easily classify, identify the pattern uh, in that shape of the animal. But if we uh, show that ch that child a new animal that uh, he or she uh, never saw before, he's, he's not going to be able to answer and say, okay, this is a new animal. He will probably, if you uh, show a leopard, uh, that child will say that uh, this animal is a cat, for example, because he... he was unable to identify the difference. And, and this is something that we must take care of when implementing AI algorithms, because AI always provides an answer, but sometimes it can be the good answer or the best answer or the quickest answer, depending on how we train it. But it, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the truth or the right uh, answer for everything. The second technology is uh, the metaverse. Okay, the metaverse also called Web3 or Web3.0 or uh, immersive technologies or virtual reality, extended reality, a lot of uh, uh, ways to, to define that. Uh, we can say, uh, we can use this this uh, Garner diagram. You know, Garner is, is one of the top uh, brands uh, about market uh, research uh, regarding technology. And uh, they define the metaverse as a new uh, reality, a new, uh, a new sort or group of technologies that uh, include different aspects uh, to provide an, a fully immersive experience to a person. And uh, I, I'd like to, to uh, use as, uh, as a, a, an example that you will be absolutely familiar with. Uh, so you are, uh, probably all of you are called uh, native, native digital. Uh, because when you were born, there were uh, smartphones and there was uh, screens connected to the internet, etc., uh, etc. Et so you 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 were born with that technology, and and you feel probably more comfortable writing on a, a device on a, a digital device than writing by hand. Uh, with the metaverse, we will experience another transformation and, and we call it the native virtuals because the metaverse will be a space, complete space, completely digital immersive space where people will spend a lot or a big share of their daily lives inside it. Uh, probably working, probably studying, probably enjoying, uh, watching uh, contents or playing with others or just uh, meeting other relatives or friends, etc., uh, etc. Et and uh, it will be enabled by a number of technologies. So digital currency can be used there, uh, e-commerce for sure. So it's now you have to think that even with uh, the latest technologies in e-commerce that we have today, when you go to Amazon, for example, you are watching the same catalog 90% uh, 
similar to what we used 40 years ago on paper. So you are watching pictures of the product and then a list of features and then the price. And the only difference is that on, on paper uh, catalogs, on paper uh, brochures, uh, you had to call by phone or you had to go to the shop to buy the item. And now you have a button, you press the button and you get it delivered to your house uh, the next day or, or whatever. But this is not a very rich environment, uh, speaking of digital capabilities. It would be much better if you could experience the object in 3D even if you are, for example, looking for a fridge for your kitchen, if you could go right inside your kitchen and place virtual appliances there, virtual fridges uh, there, you could see how they fit, uh, how they look, uh, how is uh, how, how, how they are like uh, with the rest of the colors of your kitchen, with the lining, uh, the, the illumination of the room, etc. And uh, all these things uh, will happen in the metaverse. And this is the reason why we expect that all video conferencing will transform into immersive rooms, uh, classes. Uh, now, virtual classes like this one will be transformed into a more uh, 3D immersive environment. And uh, when you are speaking and you, when you are meeting others, you will not use social media on, on uh, two-dimensional screens. You will use a three-dimensional a space that is more comfortable and, and uh, provide much uh, better experiences. And for this reason, the people that, uh, that uh, are born in these uh, immersive environments will be native uh, virtuals because probably they will feel more comfortable in those virtual environments than meeting in person or than doing physical things in the physical reality. And this is something that uh, will transform all all uh, what all, all we do in many aspects I just put here some ideas uh, uh, travel leisure so you will be able for example to attend a concert uh, by Frank Sinatra in New York just uh, in a virtual space and and it will be not a recorded concert it will be generated by AI. Uh, with past images and, and music, and probably Frank Sinatra never uh, never sang uh, this this uh, songs in the past. But it doesn't. Uh, you you will not care. Uh, it will be a new experience and and new uh, new reality that was unable in the physical world before. And. Uh, this is my new book. Uh, Gianluca told it before. Uh, it has been launched uh, this very week, so it's uh, now available. Uh, I put uh, here the Amazon link, but you can ask for it uh, in any library. It will be ready for uh, reaching out uh, all, all libraries worldwide. And uh, anyway, I also include here my personal website because there is a contact form there. So if you have questions or if you want uh, anything related to, to that, uh, you, you will be able to, to contact me directly. The book is called Journey to the Metaverse, and it's only about the metaverse, but the metaverse it condenses a lot of technologies, as we have seen. And uh, it's uh, an explanation of the possibilities of those technologies what is in the industry and what are the implications. Part of the content of the book is, of course, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation today. And the third technology, brain-computer interfaces, BCIs, is probably the one that is not so common uh, because only a few news about uh, Neuralink by Elon Musk has been uh, told uh, in, 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 in the recent uh, months. The idea is that uh, BCIs are chips or are electronic devices or optical devices, it depends, or mag magnetic devices that are connected to the brain. It can be, they can be physically connected. So you pin it uh, through the skull to connect it to the brain, or they can simply measure the waves, the brain waves uh, in, in distance. So you simply patch, uh, put a patch on your, on your head. 
And they can be unidire unidirectional or be bidirectional. The, the difference, the uh, unidirectional can be from the brain to electronics. So you can use your brain to control things or you can use uh, the device to, to, you can use your brain to dump some information outside or it can be uh, from the electronics to the brain. For example, if you are a blind person, you can implant uh, something that is connected to a camera and then you can see uh, without the need to have uh, to use your eyes and uh, this is something that it seems uh, science fiction but uh, i i in my in my work uh, in my daily work i meet companies that are doing this kind of prototypes today so we will see them in the market probably in in less than five ten years and the most ambition part of course is having bidirectional a connection because it means that you will able to connect to plug your brain to uh to the cloud and uh, you will be able to do a lot of things because everything will be synchronized and you may be able to have your digital avatar for example synchronized with your feelings or you may see uh, what is happening in the metaverse only uh, with, through through that direct connection so it's a uh, bidirectional connectivity is, is incredible because it's like uh, the the possibility to to connect uh, your brain uh, to a router uh, an internet uh, router and and, and uh, everyone connected to the internet uh, directly so it's it's a bit crazy applications of bcis uh, some of them, this is a very emerging field, but uh, one of them is to use exoskeleton. For example, we see here a picture of a person with four arms. Uh, two arms uh, are the physical arms, but two other arms at are support arms. Uh, this person can, con uh, can uh, control them using AI support, but uh, they, they, uh, this person could con uh, connect, uh, control the third and fourth arm, arm using his brain directly uh, with a device like this one. Uh, or as I said before, you can have a, a virtual eye, uh, 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 an electronic eye connected to your brain. Or maybe uh, you can put uh, additional, uh, additional gadgets to your body to run faster, to jump higher, to lift higher, uh, weight, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now it's, uh, I put here, by the way, I put here telepathy. It's, this is not uh, a dream. This is being experimented right now in, in the army, for example. Uh, you know, uh, the army are in, in uh, soldiers are uh, when, when they are in battle. Uh, they are in a very noisy environment. They don't see each other. They cannot shout each other. Uh, it's very difficult to coordinate uh, people in the field. So they are experiencing with uh, some devices that let them uh, deliver sin uh, sign uh, signals, signals from one person to another using telepathy. Just thinking of it and all the rest of the people receive a signal in, in, in their brain that this person is, is uh, uh, giving an order, for example. Uh, and, and I said before, this, all, all these applications are now in experimental level and they are used to, uh, uh, they, they are targeting now to uh, people with disabilities. So it's more in healthcare industry, but uh, uh, the, the idea is uh, that uh, all these innovations need to be widely tested before they go mainstream. So they are tested in normally expensive environments. Uh, so surgery or uh, yes, people with disabilities uh, normally in pilot uh, environments. But once the technology is tested and uh, once it is uh, feasible, then a large invest investment comes typically and they go mainstream and they sell uh, uh, devices for 100 euros or 200, 500 euros. And then many people start to use them for a lot of additional uses, including leisure or, or uh, more domestic uses. Okay, uh, so... Now we are approaching the the end of the of the session, and uh, I I just wanted to do 
a briefing, a summary of what we will see in 10 or probably five years. Uh, we, are, we can't be sure because it will depend, of course, on the amount of investment uh, put by the large uh, tech giants. Uh, we have to uh, think about the side effects of all these technologies. The first one is, is very well known, the cyber syndrome, uh, is people that uh, become reliant or dependent on technology. So if you ask somebody to close or shut down his or her mobile phone uh, indefinitely, for example, until the rest of the day, then uh, anxiety arises a lot. Uh, this person feels uncom uncomfortable, unsafe, uh, like uh, he's or she's uh, missing something, or maybe she has uh, received an emergency call and he's, he doesn't know about it. So this is called the cyber syndrome. And it's going to increase as much as, as we add more and more technologies around us every day. Uh, another risk is the unsupervised user diversity mix. The problem with uh, immersive technologies, for example, is that we cannot know who is on the other side. We don't know if the other person we see, we watch the avatar, but we don't know if this person is a man or is a woman. We don't care. But if uh, what is the, the, the race, the religion, where does he live? What are his uh, uh, incomes? Uh, we don't know anything about that. And the problem is that most of these applications are governed by AI and AI replicate patterns. And, and, and this is something that we care today. So we try to give the same opportunities for everyone, for all, all the people, all gender, uh, religion, race, place, uh, income rates, etc. But in the digital world, it will be much more difficult uh, because probably dominant, uh, dominant groups will have more weights for AI algorithms. And this is something that we have to, to super, su supervise. Uh, the, this, the third point is a derivative from that. So unfairness, uh, we can use bots uh, and we can use uh, superhumans. For example, if we are rich and we want to strengthen our body with additional features, we want to run faster. We want to think to have more memory or more intelligence because we implant a chip uh, with AI in our brain, AI support, uh, we extend our intelligence and this can create uh, more inequalities in society. Uh, the fourth is very similar to the one. The one is not illness, the fourth is illness. The fourth, uh, the fourth uh, side effect is when you get sick, physically sick because uh, user addiction. Uh, Cyberbullying, everyone knows about it, and as uh, as as we go and, and evolve to more inverse, immersive environments, uh, cyberbullying will be able to be harder because it's more immersive and more impactful. Sorry, uh, something that I call "Living Among the Dead" uh, in the book. This is a, a, a title, a chapter title on the book. Uh, "Living Among the Dead" means that. In the metaverse, for example, we will uh, have uh, a digital avatar and uh, we will live and we will interact with other digital avatars. What happens and the avatars probably, if you are a, na uh, if you are a, a, native, uh, di a native virtual person, the avatar will be more important. The, the, the behavior of that a digital avatar will be more important than your physical appearance. For example, you don't you don't pay attention to your clothing at home because nobody cares about it. Nobody sees uh, your clothing at home, but you care a lot about the behavior, about how others uh, see you in the virtual space, and this may lead to using AI. Like we use filters today with photos, and we enhance our appearance on photos or videos we could be able to use AI to improve the performance of our avatar. So our avatar could be semi-automatic uh, and could be answering or clicking likes virtually to other to our friends' uh, posts, etc. 
without our supervision because when we go to sleep, we want our avatar continue interacting in the metaverse. And what happens is if, if we die, if we die, our avatar will be able to continue life alive in the metaverse forever. And this is something that we will meet. So we, we, we will meet entities in these virtual worlds that we don't know if they are bots, if they are pure AI created entities, if they are people, or if they are people, if they were people, but they died and they didn't switch off their avatars or maybe their families or their friends wanted the avatar to keep, to keep, uh, to be kept st uh, still alive to continue inter interacting with this person like uh, if uh, this person was alive. And this is something incredible because we never we never saw that before in, in, in our social interactions. And uh, of course, uh, freedom of expressions, uh, rational skills. So as more as we change uh, our behavior in society, everyone, everything else will will change. Uh, the freedom of expression probably is not so relevant now uh, than in the past because now there is the option to click and to send a comment every everywhere. Uh, rational skills will change because when you don't need to think about a specific thing, uh, you tend to forget about it. Uh, these skills uh, becomes. Uh, um, uh, poorer becomes becomes worse uh, and if we have AI to perform a lot of rational uh, in our daily lives we will forget about doing that and, and it's not crazy if you have ca a calculator probably you don't you don't know how to do a, a fraction or or a square root these kind of things where everyone who went to school 30 40 years ago, knew about it today nobody knows about how to perform a square root uh, manually because there is a machine that does it uh, instantly and much better and uh, this is something that uh, we have to consider and finally uh, i just highlighted three technologies ai metaverse and brain computer interfaces there are others uh, other technologies, digital twins, for example, is also likely to disrupt uh, a lot of things. Is the way we create this virtual space and we correlate it with the physical space. For example, we want to have a digital twin of our city. So uh, the city mayor can monitor the, the city in real time and use it and do perform simulations of improvements for traffic, for pollution, for noise, for whatever. Uh, this is something that is uh, very trendy now in the research is, is uh, starting to, to, to emerge in, in, in many papers. Soft robotics, uh, we are used to classical metal robotics, metal robots, uh, but there is a lot of uh, research uh, in uh, providing soft robotics. Uh, the benefits of soft robotics is that they are, uh, they are, they, they don't produce so noisy movements, so they are more silent, but the most important thing is that they can manage, they can handle very delicate things. Yeah. So, for example, in industry, uh, they are testing this kind of soft robotics, for example, for um, food uh, elements. So, if if we if we want if we need to move uh, cookies, for example, in a in an industrial plant, it's much better to use a soft robot with rubber in the fingers uh, rather than than uh, use a hard. Uh, a hard tray or a hard uh, robotic arm to perform the movement. Uh, every, everything will be uh, easier. And the final uh, technology is, is not that technology itself, it's called gamification. And uh, many companies are putting this into the equation of many social relationships. Uh, gamification means uh, converting everything or converting something into a game. For example, training in many companies is being done today using games. So it's like a, a competition or is is like a, a yes, a, a game where you can earn points, you can earn a badge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
but it's not only applied to games, uh, sorry, to, to training. Training is the most evident one to make it more appealing, to gain your attraction and so on. But uh, the, the gamification can go further because uh, the problem with gamification is that we are not conscious about what we are doing. We are just enjoying. It's, it's, it's something that is inside our brain, is is producing uh, 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 an hormone uh, and 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 uh, we are feeling happy because we are playing. We are not uh, doing a hard work. We are not uh, uh, doing a sacrifice for for something. We are uh, we are enjoying, and uh, we have to be careful because uh, some things are uh, are are thought to be better. Uh, implemented on society using gamification when they are not so good things. So, for example, if uh, somebody tries to reduce the freedom of movement or the freedom of uh, of speech or these kind of things, uh, frequently they start using gamification to make people feel that they are enjoying doing something, and then the the the, the end of the game is is not a a good point to to reach. And uh, Final slide uh, is this concept, digital immortality. One uh, I heard uh, recently say to some scientists, uh, say that uh, the people that are going to be immortal have already, uh, are already born. Probably... Uh, we don't know how, we don't know if we will extend the, our physical life, but uh, what we can start thinking from now on is that more and more of our digital existence, uh, interactions, history, etc., etc., is in the digital space. So our photos, our videos, our track history, our uh, activities, exams, uh, our uh, information that we use for our daily life, everything is in the digital space. And with these disruptive technologies, providing AI, moving us into more immersive uh, digital spaces and connecting our physical body to the digital space, this is the roadmap for having ourselves in the digital world. And once we are in the digital world, there is a discussion about uh, this concept. Uh, we will become immortal. Maybe some people will prefer to uh, finish the physical existence and continue in the digital world. This is a very philosophical topic and is very dangerous because in the end, everything is physical. So computers are in the physical reality and we need to be here to supervise or to produce or to uh, place, uh, put them into, into uh, working uh, conditions. Uh, but many people will move and enjoy much more in the near future in the metaverse or in the immersive digital world than in the physical world. And uh, this is uh, something that I normally discuss. I have some videos and I normally upload some videos from time to time in this YouTube channel. It's called The Tower. And it's about, you will, if you go there, you will find one video for each of one, uh, each one of these technologies I, I depicted today. And uh, you can, of course, subscribe and make your comments. I'll be more than happy because it's, this is something that I, I like to 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 know what do you think about it, what is there. If you discover something that is uh, worth to mention in in the channel, of course, uh, we can we can do a video about that. And I hope that you like this presentation. Uh, if you have uh, some questions or you want to discuss anything, or Gianluca, I give you as the moderator, I give you the control back. Thank you, Antonio, and thanks for your talk. Now, um, there would be clapping at this point. You will have to imagine that, I suspect, because uh, probably we'll come in signs if, you, if people want to, uh, to do that. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask something, they can put uh, that in the chat. What I would like to ask, however, to kick it off is, 
you told us what we have to expect. You, told, you gave us an, a, an idea of the, how the technologies will enter our society and probably the ones which are closer to get to our daily life. But can you, and you also touched some of the ethics, but can you, can you give us your opinion? So like, what should we do? Should we limit this technology? Shall we put that under laws? Like, let's take an example, for instance, uh, the one where you were talking about living about the dead. What shall we do? Yes, uh, in some in some points uh, we can we can we cannot do anything. Uh, it will come, but uh, it's very important because in some much more aspects we can uh, be the first or we can be early adopters in in these technologies, and we will be in a much better position to digest everything. You know, uh, for example, in AI. Uh, and, and we have experience, everyone probably has experienced the uh, chat GPT and how it works, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can take profit of that instead of seeing that as a major change that uh, provides uh, some threats or some risks. We can know how it works, we can understand them very well. And then we can identify the risk and we can identify the opportunities and we can go for new opportunities. For example, yesterday I was watching a, a, a video from a very famous economist and this person uh, has hired uh, another person in, in his team uh, who is an expert of using chat GPT. So you don't believe it, but there is a new job about being a master of chat, of chat GPT. So this person needs to produce content for, for his company. I don't know what kind of content he's thinking of, but he has just hired a person with experience. Uh, the experience uh, she is it's a, it's a woman she can have on, on the platform because it's very recent, but she has uh, he has hired uh, this person for uh, for his company as an expert in in, in in chat gpt to perform the the searches the how how to speak to chat gpt correctly to obtain the the right result and we will we will uh, have uh, a lot of opportunities here because there will be a lot of changes so we have to think where the world is moving probably this will not come in less than 5 10 years but if we start if we know the 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 goal we can follow the right path. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's an interesting question. What is the right path? Yeah, uh, but yes, I, I, I would um, second your optimistic view of the future uh, and not just the risks uh, approach maybe. Yes, it's an opportunity which is coming and we need to, to learn to ride the oars. Probably these guys who are listening will be much more agile than you and I, Antonio, in that sense. Um, guys, any question before I ask another one? So we have a question from Reza and one from Cosmo. So Reza says, what engineering articles technologically need to be improved for it to be able to work properly in the three areas? So what are the difficulties? What are the well, challenges? AI, uh, AI has uh, two challenges. One is, a classic challenge uh, is power, power, computing power. So we need much more power in computing to perform much more complex uh, AI algorithms. This is the first challenge. This is expected to be solved progressively. So um, uh, with more powerful computers, we will have more AI. And also with more data, uh, we, we must uh, take into consideration that AI relies 90% on the training. So training is done with data. We have more and more detailed uh, information ready to train new systems. And the second is more sophisticated. AI, machine uh, uh, neural networks are done today uh, uh, like an artisan in an artisan way, okay? So when I show this picture, these structures, all these structures are provided, are suggested by people, and you don't know which one is going to work better on 
any algorithms. You have to start trying and say, okay, I will add one more la layer, one more neuron, uh, more feedback in a circular way, or this, everything is done uh, manually today. And of course, when this a way of building neural networks can be done by AI itself. So applying some kind of automation, some kind of, of rules, and this has to be discovered yet. Uh, this will disrupt also AI. Uh, but AI is probably the most mature of them. For the metaverse, uh, the most challenging part is uh, combined, is, 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 you, you can guess, is, is Mm, uh, 3D glasses, 3D goggles. Uh, they they are uh, they are heavy. They mm, uh, they they are not um, uh, used for long periods. For probably more than two hours, uh, you get tired. Uh, you you get you have a problem in vision, and then you get blur vision, etc. So they are working on uh, what they call augmented reality and mixed reality. That is using. Uh, glasses like uh, sunglasses uh, or, or very small devices, even, even contact lenses that can provide this immersive experience and connect it with the physical world. And all the developments are on this part. And the other part regarding the metaverse is, is around the other technological challenges to create 3D environments. We need to create a massive amount of 3D content to work in real time when people are moving. So this is uh, absolutely impossible with the computer power we, we have today. And they are, uh, there are, this morning I was with a company that is, uh, has invented a way to um, produce a 3D environment in real time in less than five milliseconds latency. So uh, new sensors, new ways to produce 3D words much more uh, much faster and, and more easily. Uh, this is the second the second challenge. And for brain computer, uh, the problem is uh, connecting to the brain. This is the real challenge because now we are thinking. Every, anyone is thinking on connecting pins, uh, um, metallic pins, or some other materials, but hard pins connected to the brain. And this is not good because you know when you when you uh, uh, when you put uh, something inside be behind uh, uh, behind the, the the skin, there is a reaction in the in the blood and and it it, it doesn't go. Sorry, well. Antonio, if I interrupt you, sorry if I interrupt you, but in interest of maintaining some of the questions, the guys only have other five minutes. So um, okay. So what I'm hearing is that the challenge there is the human, is the body reaction to the interface. And in okay. fact, that's where we are as a challenge. We have another question from Cosmo who asks, how do you feel about AI threatening jobs and in particular, low skill jobs like driving, tracking, fast food, etc.? Okay, uh, this is a very good question. So uh, my opinion is forget about these jobs. Uh, they will disappear. Uh, uh, the same way that uh, in the past century, when uh, tools uh, were used in, in farms, in, in the fields, uh, many people, most 80%, 90% of the population was working in agriculture. Now mm, it's less than 10%. So, uh, but it doesn't mean that there is no other jobs. So probably... Uh, low skill jobs uh, will uh, disappear but not not so not only low skill jobs uh, there was a, a a paper speaking about how this uh, there was a news uh, a, a report speaking about how uh, tech giants so amazon twitter facebook etc are fighting a lot of people and most of them are middle managers because middle managers just receive orders and check that everything is going uh, okay down uh, in their in their teams and this this can be very easily done by ai if trained properly by the director the top director so uh, we have to think about ai as another tool uh, but we can uh, we have to think also that there will be more more uh, new jobs that were not able uh, in the past so as as uh, we get used to ai 
we will need other uh, more creative uh, jobs or more uh, supervisory uh, jobs uh, and, and we have to be watching the market because there will be as i said before the new chat gpt expert uh, didn't exist uh, last year and there will be not only expert in chat in chat gpt but expert in how to implant implement ai and how to supervise ai and how to optimize ai etc cetera, etc cetera. and this this can be a huge field or, and that, and that response, I suspect, to Cosmos' comments on uh, what about artisan jobs or digital artists, I think there is a part of creativity which will always complement or be augmented by uh, AI. And the um, AI can be a tool to increase your design space. And in that sense, already working, in my case, with artists which use AI to facilitate their job is like having a new okay. type of scalpel. Exactly. And precisely artists are the part where AI is much worse. I, I heard yesterday somebody told me, imagine that, that uh, AI goes to a bar and the barman asks uh, that AI, what are you drinking? And the answer of the AI will be always, the same. what are others drinking? So never, never be original, always based on patterns, past patterns. And this is the, the job of an artist is to be original. AI can be used as a tool, but uh, the, the artist uh, will be original. And also people like to buy things and to feel things that are original. And this is the way why we, uh, when we go out for dinner, for example, we appreciate a candle on the table. Uh, even if we have uh, electric uh, lights from more than one century ago, but we appreciate this, this artisan work, this, this feeling of connecting with nature, with the basics, with uh, something that is unique. And, and this will, uh, my opinion is these jobs will continue. And not, not... Uh, Antonio, sorry, uh, let's go to the last question because uh, as I said, time is, uh, the guys have other lectures after this. So Stefania asks, Going back to who is alive and who is dead, uh, dead. Regarding, question regarding the avatars. Do you not think that giving rights to dead avatars to be kept alive can be an issue? Or what about giving human rights to AI, robots, avatars? What problems can that take? That seems to be a, a, a question for an Asimov book. Yes, yes, of course. This is, uh, if you read Asimov, is uh, everything is there. My opinion is more prosaic, is more practical. I think that all human rights and rights in general are done as a reaction of a problem, of a massive problem. So riots on the streets or massive poverty, people dying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If, if, if there is no real threat, nothing is given as a right. So uh, for robots, uh, rights for robots, I don't believe that. Uh, probably a, a change in the tax system, uh, it's possible. So it, it's not fair that uh, one uh, company has to pay uh, taxes based on salaries, based on the people working there and not paying taxes on robots working there because they do the same the same job. So. To me, being practical, I, I do expect uh, some kind of regulation taxing uh, specific robots that uh, can do the same jobs than humans in the future. Well, you, being practical, you expect that the taxman will arrive before we give rights to anyone, yes. Uh, the, um, but we discussed in one of the previous lectures the, the fact will loving a robot be something appropriate? And we had, um, so in... Uh, uh, in Sussex, one of our lecturers is a, uh, a person who works very strongly on the um, uh, committee, the government committee on rights and regulations for AI. So um, you think that nothing is coming, but my, uh, certainly the discussion is hot. Yes, yes. And, and uh, we always tend to love the things that we put a name to them. So yes. if we name a robot with a person name or a specific name, 
uh, you start to love it, uh, and and even you can you can start loving somehow your vacuum cleaner robot at home because it always it's always there doing some kind of noise, and if if it's not longer there, then you miss something is is missing at home. Uh, is is human? Is human nature to love the things that we that we put names because we think they are unique? They provide unique value, and it can be another person, it can be a pet, it can be an animal, a dog, or it can be a robot. This is this is true. Right, guys. Uh, ten seconds for the last question. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. And this is to show that I can count up to 10, obviously. And thanks to Antonio for his time and for his Thank you all uh, for, for provoking this invitation. I'm, talk. I'm very, 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 very pleased to, to speak to you. And, and uh, please contact me for anything that you think after this interview, this, this uh, presentation. Uh, I, I will be glad to, to answer and to connect with any one of you. Okay, perfect. So let me stop the recording here. And uh, guys, see you after Easter.